For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Now, uh, one commentator I read, I, I, I love guys who have imagination. He, he said, if you, could, if you could get a microscope and you could see underneath everything in creation. So you could see past the atoms and past the, the particles inside the atom. And you could see, like, you could just get as deep as you could. You, you might just, using our divine imagination, see this tiny little inscription that said, made by J.C., Right, like if you just get deep enough, right? If you get past the molecules and atoms and the dark matter or whatever, right? If you could just get deep enough, you'd see this tiny little inscription made by JC. Look at me, that includes you and that includes me. And Jesus created all things according to Colossians by and for himself. Look at me, that includes you and me, which means I was created and you were created for Jesus, which is why John is making the argument that you can only find life in him. Why? Because that's what you were created for. Now, if that's true, and it's true, then man, that should help us make sense of our angst, right? Because if I have been created by Jesus, like you get down into the essence of who I am, and you got a little inscription made by JC for JC, like you find that inscription on me, then it makes all kinds of sense of why my job is never ultimately going to be satisfied, satisfied to me, because I have not made, been made by my job and for my job. I have been made by Jesus for Jesus. It makes sense why Lauren, as amazing as that woman is, will never be for me what I most deeply need because I have not been made by Lauren for Lauren. I have been made by Jesus for Jesus. It makes sense why my kids, as much as I delight in them, will never ultimately be satisfying to me because I have not been made by them or for them. I have not been made by sex or for sex, by money or for money. I have not been made by success or for success. I have been made by Christ for Christ. And life is found there and there alone. And this is what we're seeing in this text. My ancient friend, Augustine, says it this way. You move us to delight in praising you. I'm going to come back to that phrase. For you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. So, so I love the first phrase. Don't miss the first phrase for the point that's being made in the second. You move us to delight in praising you. So, so here's, here, here's the human experience, right? I just can't wait for fill in the blank. And then what happens? A lot of times we actually get to step into that I can't wait for Right? I can't wait to get this promotion, to get this car, to get this house, to get this relationship, for this, for that, for this. And we step into it, and there's this moment of praise. Like, I'm not lying. There's a, you get that promotion, you start a business, right? right? You, you kind of graduate and get your first job. You get that first house. You, you get married or find a friend group that you're going to do deep life with. You have a child. You finally make the kind of money that you thought maybe you would eventually be able to make. And there's a moment of praise in that. There's this moment that feels like you've arrived, but it doesn't linger. It does not linger because you are not made by or for. So what does Augustine mean here? And I don't mean to exegete Augustine, but um, when Augustine says you move us to delight in praising you, he's talking about moving us out of praising the, these other ancillary things. Like, it's a very different thing to say, ah, thank you, God, for this job. Thank you, God, for this house. Thank you, God, for this money. Thank you, God, for this relationship. Thank you, God, for this. Thank you, God, for this. Thank you, God. All of that is good and right and beautiful. But there's this thing that happens in the soul because of the word where we finally just go, thank you, and we relinquish everything else. And, and that's what you see so often in the Bible when men and women are praising Jesus in the midst of some of the most horrific, difficult circumstances imaginable. Why can the apostles praise the name of Jesus after they had the flesh beat off their back and, and they, they leave the Sanhedrin covered in their own blood and swelling? They, they left singing and rejoicing? Like, what is that? 
It's relinquishment. It's praise you for whatever. You have me, I am yours, come what may, you are my king. 